Welcome to the RPTM Podcast, the show that breaks down the myths of monolithic history and tells our story through multiple lenses. I'm your host, Professor Ryan Lancaster. Today's episode is partially underwritten by you, the listener. Find out ways to support the podcast on the website, ryanglancaster.com. Episode 3, Hawaiians, Norse, Natives, Food, and Music. Academics has done a real number on me. After countless hours sitting in a classroom, whether in the back row or up front giving a lecture, one thing stands out to me to be a pox on the American education system, the group project. Such a vile form of torture. Everyone remembers the first group project they had to do. Their middle school teacher paired them off with two to four other people to give a presentation on some topic or another. It was something you didn't necessarily have a passion for, but you wanted to get a decent grade, so you're willing to do the work with others on this task. Now enter the actors. First, the bossy student that is the loudest and most insistent on doing things their way. They refuse to work with others and have a shared vision of only their vision. You know the type, self-aggrandizing, that have an inflated self-worth. These are the people that run for political office someday. The other student is far more insipid. This person sits back quietly, doesn't contribute, aside from nodding their head in approval occasionally. They promise to give the presentation after you make the poster board and you do all the research. As the group toils away laboriously, they sit and wait to deliver the speech portion that everyone for some reason tries to avoid like the plague. Then, in an act of cunning treachery, the day the presentation is due, that kid is out sick. So, the bossy kid makes you do the presentation because when the rubber hits the road, the domineering kid is loud, not actually informed. You were played like a fiddle. Why this clearly anecdotal story? Rule number three of history. Credit is important. Everyone, whether political party or ethnic group, wants to take credit for the past. Who built what? Who was the first? In the scheme of things, this can seem innocuous. Or harmless. But not if you ask why the credit is being taken. The Colonization of Hawaii Historians often neglect the history of the non-continental United States. The Hawaiian Islands had been inhabited for millions of years until around 300 to 600 CE. The Polynesians from the Marquesas Islands were the first to reach the Hawaiian Islands. Settling by the waters, these natives started small farming systems that became some of their primary food sources. Another group of settlers arrived in a hundred years later. This second wave of immigrants was the Tahitians, who were also of Polynesian descent. The Tahitians oppressed the first settlers from the Marquesas, calling them commoners and forcing them to run off and live in the mountains. It was the Polynesians from Tahiti who came to inhabit much of the Hawaiian Islands before the first Westerners landed on the islands in the late 1700s. The Hawaiians had numerous temples that were used to worship different kinds of gods, Essentially, these shrines came in two types, those being raised platforms and uh, walled enclosures. Oracle towers were also a regular type of structure found in these temples. Most Hawaiians would pray for and have rituals for including aid in war, fertility, harvesting seasons, death, attaining adulthood, and birth. The kahuna would typically act as ritual leaders and precipitators. The kapu system was also applied to religious practices as the strict set of rules guarded against illegal or improper actions. Farming and fishing were both essential aspects of Hawaiian life. The Polynesians who first inhabited the Hawaiian Islands brought several plants and animals that became staples in their diet, from sugarcane and taro to chickens and pigs. Agriculture became a significant industry that fueled Hawaii's economy for a long time. The land was divided through the Ahupua system, a way for sharing the area among the chieftains and their people. Each Ahupua 
was a wedge-shaped piece of land running the tops of the mountains and widening towards the shoreline. Most of the farming took place in areas between the mountaintops and the coastline. At the same time, the fishing was done in designated beach areas of each Ahupua. Ahupua were appointed by the king depending on rank and standing and how resource-rich the land was. Neighboring Ahupuas often trade goods with each other to ensure that all were prosperous. The first inhabitants of Hawaiian islands brought their customs, religious beliefs, philosophies, arts, and crafts along with them. Though many of the traditions and rituals practiced by Hawaiian natives can be traced back to the Polynesian cultures of the Marquesas and of Tahiti, the Hawaiian natives were the ones who redefined and perfected the different aspects of Polynesian culture. An actual example of an area in which Hawaiians excelled over the Polynesian cousins was in clothing. Native Hawaiians used techniques similar to Polynesian ancestors to create a type of material called kapa, which was often used to fashion shirts, shawls, and loincloths. Although this type of material was regularly crafted and used in other Polynesian cultures, the Hawaiians took it to a level of quality far beyond what different cultures had. The Hawaiian kapa was dyed in various colors from vegetables, infused with fragrances from flowers, and designed with bamboo stamped patterns. Another aspect of culture that the Hawaiians excelled at in their recreational activities and physical skills. One of the main reasons Hawaiians excelled in arts and crafts and expertise is because they had competitions to showcase their talent and entertain one another. From canoe races and swimming displays to war games and other athletic endeavors, the Hawaiians have grand tournaments and competitions spanning neighboring regions and neighboring islands. Spectators often gamble on the outcomes of these competitions, especially the Ali, who often sponsored the most influential athletes. One of the most recognized and well-known Hawaiian arts is the hula. Contrary to what many people think, hula is not just a dance for enjoyment. The truth is, the dance and chants of hula are usually based on traditions, myths, tales, history, religious rites, and general philosophies of Hawaiians. These poetic celebrations of life and culture convey stories about who the Hawaiians are and what the Hawaiians were all about. Norse Colonization of North America Italians would like you to believe that the first interactions with Europeans in North America was Christopher Columbus. But Europeans had made the voyage hundreds of years prior to 1492. The Norse colonization of North America begins in the late 10th century CE, when Norsemen explored and settled areas of the North Atlantic. Remains of Norse buildings were found near the northern tip of Newfoundland in 1960. This discovery aided the reignition of archaeological exploration for the Norse in the North Atlantic. The Norse settlements in North America islands of Greenland lasted almost 500 years. While voyages, for example, to collect timber were likely to have occurred for some time, there is no evidence of any lasting Norse settlement on the mainland of North America. According to the sagas of Icelanders, Norsemen from Iceland first settled Greenland in the 980s. There is no reason to doubt the authority of the information that the sagas supply regarding the very beginning of the settlement. They cannot be treated as primary evidence for the history of Norse Greenland because they embody the literary preoccupations of writers and audiences in medieval Iceland that are not always reliable. Eric the Red, having been banished from Iceland for manslaughter, explored the uninhabited southwestern coast of Greenland during the three years of his banishment. He made plans to entice settlers to the area, naming it Greenland, to assume that people would be eager to go there because the land had a good name. This essentially made him the first travel agent in human history. According to the Icelandic sagas, the Norse started to explore lands west of Greenland only a few years after the Greenland settlements were established. In 985, while sailing from Iceland to Greenland with a migration fleet consisting of 400 to 700 settlers and uh, 25 other ships, 14 of which actually completed the journey, a mer merchant by the name of Bjarni Herfelsen was blown off course, and after three days of sailing, 
he sighted land west of the fleet. Bjarni was only interested in finding his father's farm, but he described his discovery to Leif Erikson. The latter explored the area in more detail and planted a small settlement 15 years later. Using the roots, landmarks, currents, rocks, and winds that Bjarni had described to him, Leif sailed from Greenland westward toward the Labrador Sea with a crew of 35, sailing the same boat Bjarni had used to make the voyage. Leif and others wanted his father, Eric the Red, to lead this expedition and talked him into it. However, as Eric attempted to join his son Leif on the voyage towards these new lands, he fell off his horse as he slipped on a wet rock near the shore. Thus, he was injured and stayed behind. Leif wintered in 1001 CE, probably near Cape Bald on the northern tip of Newfoundland. Squash berries, gooseberries, and cranberries all grew wild in the area. There were different explanations for Leif describing fermented berries as wine, hence the New World would name Vinland after all the goodies that grew on vines. Settlements in continental North America aimed to exploit natural resources such as furs and lumber, which was in short supply in Greenland. It is unclear why the short-term settlements did not become permanent, though it is likely partly because of hostile relations with the indigenous people, referred to as scralings by the Norse. Nevertheless, sporadic voyages to land for forages, timber, and trade with the locals could have lasted as long as 400 years. In 1004, Leif's brother Thorvald Eriksson sailed with a crew of 30 men to Vinland to spend the following winter at Leif's camp. In the spring, Thorvald attacked nine of the local people who were sleeping under three skin-covered canoes. The ninth victim escaped and soon came back to the Norse camp with force. Thorvald was killed by an arrow that succeeded in passing through the barricade. Although brief hostilities ensued, the Norse explorers stayed another winter and left the following spring. Subsequently, another of Leif's brother, Thorstein, sailed to the New World to retrieve his dead brother's body, but he died before leaving Greenland. In 1009, Thornfinn the Valiant supplied three ships with livestock and 160 men and women, a sign of peaceful relations between the indigenous people and the Norsemen is noted here. The two sides swapped with furs and gray squirrel skins for milk and red cloth, which the natives tied around their heads as sort of a headdress. There are conflicting stories, but one account states that a bull belonging to Thornfin came storming out of the woods, so frightening the natives that they ran to their skin boats and rode away. They returned three days later in force. The Norse retreated. Leif Erikson's half-sister Freydis was pregnant and unable to keep up with the retreating Norsemen. She called out to them to stop fleeing from such pitiful wretches, adding that if she had weapons, she could do better than that. Freyda seized the sword belonging to a man who had been killed by the natives. She pulled one of her breasts out of her bodice and struck it with the sword, frightening the natives who fled. She essentially solidified the fact that pregnant women are more terrifying than a Viking warrior. Taking ownership for history leads us to an unfortunate dark side of history, pseudo-history. Purported runestones have been found in North America, most famously the Kensington runestone. These are generally considered to be hoaxes or misinterpretations of Native American petroglyphs. There are many claims of Norse colonization in New England, none well founded. The 19th century Harvard chemist Eben Norton Horsford connected the Charles River Basin to places described in Norse sagas and elsewhere. He published several books on the topic and had plaques, monuments, and statues erected in the Norse honor. His work received little support from mainstream historians and archaeologists at the time, and even less today. Other 19th century writers seized such false notions of Viking history to promote the superiority of white people, as well as to oppose the Catholic Church. Such misuse of Viking history and imagery reemerged in the 20th century 
among some groups promoting white supremacy. Swedish immigrant Olaf Oman said that he had found the stone late in 1898 while clearing land he had recently acquired of trees and stumps before plowing. The stone was said to be near the crest of a small knoll rising above the wetlands, lying face down entangled in the root system of a stunted poplar tree, estimated to be less than 10 to about 40 years old. The artifact weighs 200 pounds. Omen's 10-year-old son, Edward Omen, noticed some markings, and the farmer later said he thought they had found an Indian almanac. A copy of the inscription made its way to the University of Minnesota. A Scandinavian literature professor in the Scandinavian department declared the stone to be a forgery and published a discrediting article. Much like the mounds of indigenous culture, Americans of Scandinavian ancestry set out to prove their people were the first to settle the New World, regardless if they were or not. The Mississippian Culture As mentioned in the last episode, the New World was not new, and it was already settled. The Mississippian Culture, which extended throughout the Ohio and Mississippi Valleys, and built sites throughout the southeast, created the most substantial earthworks in North America north of Mexico, most notably Cahokia, on a tributary Mississippi River in present-day Illinois. Archaeologists use the term Mississippian because many of the major centers of this new way of life occurred in the Mississippi River Valley. The ten-story Monk's Mound of Cahokia has a larger circumference than the Pyramid of the Sun at Teotihuacan, or the Great Pyramid of Egypt. The six-square-mile city complex was based on the culture's cosmology, included more than 100 mounds, positioned to support their sophisticated knowledge of astronomy, and built with the understanding of varying soil types. The society began building at this site around 950 CE and reached its peak population in 1250 CE of 20,000 to 30,000 people, which was not equaled in any city in the present-day United States until 1800. Cahokia was a major regional chiefdom, with trade and tributary chiefdoms located in a range of areas from bordering the Great Lakes to the Gulf of Mexico. Kincaid is one of the largest settlements of the Mississippian culture. It was located at the southern tip of present-day Illinois. Kincaid Mounds has been notable for its significant role in Native American prehistory and for the central role the site has played in the development of modern archaeological techniques. The place had at least 11 substructure platform mounds. All the dirt used to construct this enormous earthwork was moved in baskets by hand. Artifacts from the settlement link, its primary habitation, and the mounds construction to the Mississippian period but was also occupied earlier during the woodland period. A typical Mississippian town was built near a river or creek. It covered about 10 acres of ground and was surrounded by a barrier, a fence made of wooden poles placed upright in the field. A typical Mississippian house was rectangular, about 12 feet long and 10 feet wide. The walls of a house were built by placing wooden poles upright in the trench in the ground. The poles were then covered with a woven cane matting. The cane matting was then covered with plastic made from mud. This plaster cane matting is called wattle and daub. The roof of the house was made from a steep A-shape framework of wooden poles covered with grass woven into a tight thatch. The modern-day Nashville area was a significant population center during this period. Thousands of Mississippian-era graves have been found in the city, and thousands more may exist in the surrounding area. There were once many temples and burial grounds in Nashville, especially along the Cumberland River. One temple mound was still standing as late as the 1980s. Unfortunately, the mounds in the city have all been destroyed. The Mississippian people were no longer living in the Nashville area when the first white explorers passed through. Many archaeologists believe the region experienced a sharp population decline around 1450 CE. Why this happened is a mystery. A change in climate may have affected the crops, or neighboring cities may have started fighting over land in the fertile river bottoms. 
an epidemic of some illness may have broken out, spread from town to town on the trade networks. There may have been a combination of several reasons. No one knows for sure. Some archaeologists think they may have migrated to East Tennessee. The population there seems to have increased just when the population in the Nashville area declined. But this is only an educated guess. No one knows for sure where Nashville's Mississippian people went. However, most southeastern Indian nations are certainly the descendants of Mississippian people in general. Some symbols found in Mississippian art seem to show up in the oral traditions of some southeastern Indians. The Cherokee, Choctaw, Creek, and other nations built platform mounds for their council houses. And they are still regarded mounds found in the ancestral territory as sacred places. The Hohokam Culture On the other side of the continent, native peoples were living lives very different than those out east. The Hohokam Culture was centered along the American Southwest. The ancestral Puebloan culture covered present-day four corner regions of the United States, comprising southern Utah, northern Arizona, northwestern New Mexico, and southwestern Colorado. They lived in a range of structures that included small family pit houses, larger clan-type structures, grand pueblos, and cliff-sided dwellings. The ancestral Puebloans possessed a complex network that stretched across the Colorado Plateau, linking hundreds of communities and population centers. The culture is best perhaps known for the stone and earth dwellings built along cliff walls. The Hohokam seemed to appear in Arizona quite suddenly to build a sophisticated irrigation system to water their crops. Early archaeologists proposed that Hohokam culture developed in Mexico and moved into what is now Arizona. The Hohokam were the only North American culture to rely on irrigation canals to supply water to their crops. In arid desert environment, there was not enough rainfall to grow plants. To meet their needs, the Hohokam engineered the largest and most sophisticated irrigation system in the Americas. The canals were perfectly laid out on the landscape to achieve a downhill drop of one to two feet per mile. Many of the channels were massive in size, irrigating up to 110,000 acres by 1300 CE. The Hohokam irrigation system supported the largest population in the prehistoric southwest. Life for the Hohokam focused to a large extent, on agriculture and growing crops. The canals required the organization and labor of thousands of people to build, maintain, and operate. Farmers had to protect crops from rabbits, birds, and other marauders. Planting and harvest times would require the efforts of the entire community. Disease was a significant problem for pre-industrial people. While some in the village had medical knowledge and offered traditional cures, treatments were not available for many maladies. Infant mortality was high, with perhaps one out of every four children dying before their first birthday. But life was not all work and illness. The Hohokam held large community gatherings at ball carts and temple mounds. Here, people would trade goods, and young people could meet potential marriage partners from other villages. The Hohokam organized their villages to separate and coordinate different activities. Houses clustered into residential areas. To keep the village neat, the Hohokam disposed of trash in pits and piles within specific regions. They used large open spaces in the village for messy activities, including the use of large earth ovens, which measured 6 to 10 feet across and 6 to 8 feet in depth, were used to pit bake the hearts of agave plants and other foods such as corn and possibly squash. Families lived in single-room structures that surrounded rectangular courtyards, where daily activities took place. Each room would house a nuclear family consisting of a mother, father, and children. The families joined in these courtyard groups were closely related and formed an extended family unit. In Hohokam society, if you live in a group with your parents and your brothers and sisters' families, this extended family functioned as a fundamental social and economic unit, sharing resources and daily chores. 
One of the most intriguing questions concerning the Hohokam focuses on the collapse when evidence of the Hohokam is no longer seen in archaeological records. What happened to this culture that flourished for so many centuries? Researchers have suggested that floods, salt buildup on the fields, and warfare are causes of decline, but there are reasons to doubt each of these explanations. The Hohokam deterioration is part of a larger pattern of abandonment seen throughout the American Southwest. Recent studies suggest that people began migrating toward the south during a significant drought in the Four Corners area in the 1200s. From 1200 CE to 1450 CE, large portions of the prehistoric southwest were largely abandoned. The Iroquois League of Nations The Iroquois League was established before European contact with the banding together of five of the many Iroquoian peoples who had emerged south of the Great Lakes. Many archaeologists and anthropologists believe that the League was formed around 1450 CE, though arguments have been made for an earlier date. One theory argues that the League formed shortly after a solar eclipse on August 31, 1142, an event thought to be expressed in the oral traditions about the League's origin. Some sources link an earlier ancestor of the Iroquois Confederacy to the adoption of corn as a staple crop. The Iroquois subsequently created a highly egalitarian society. One British colonial administrator declared in 1749 that the Iroquois had such absolute notions of liberty that they allow no kind of superiority over another and banish all servitude from their territories. With the formation of the League, internal conflicts were minimized. A council of 50 ruled on disputes, seeking consensus in their decisions. Raids within the member tribes ended, and they directed warfare against competitors. This allowed the Iroquois to increase in numbers while their rivals declined. The Iroquois' political cohesion rapidly became one of the most influential forces in 17th and 18th century northeastern North America. The Confederacy did not speak for all five tribes, which continued to act independently. Around 1678, the Council began to exert more power in negotiations with the colonial governments of Pennsylvania and New York. The Iroquois became adept at diplomacy, playing off the French against the British as individual tribes had earlier played the Swedes, Dutch, and English. According to one theory of Iroquois history, after becoming united in the League, the Iroquois invaded the Ohio River Valley in the territories which had become the eastern Ohio country down as far as present-day Kentucky seek additional hunting grounds. They displaced about 1,200 Siouan-speaking tribes of the Ohio River Valley. These tribes migrated to regions around the Mississippi River and the Piedmont regions of the East Coast. Other Iroquoian language peoples, including the populous Huron, with related social organizations and cultures, became extinct as tribes as a result of disease and war. They did not join the League, which invited and were much reduced after the Beaver Wars and high mortality from Eurasian infectious disease. The Birth of American Food In my mind, there are three ways to really learn about a people, their pop culture, their music, and their food. Native American food and cuisine are recognized by its use of indigenous domesticated and wild food ingredients. As Americas cover an extensive range of biomes, over 500 currently recognized Native American tribes are in the U.S. alone. Native American cuisine can vary significantly by region and culture. The essential staple foods of the indigenous peoples of the eastern woodlands have traditionally been corn, beans, and squash, known as the Three Sisters because they were planted interdependently. The seeds grew up the tall stalks of the corn, while the squash spread out at the base of the three plants and provided protection and support for the root systems. Maple syrup is another essential food staple of the eastern woodland peoples. Tree sap is collected from sugar maple trees during springtime when the nights are still cold. Birch bark containers are used in maple syrup, maple cakes, maple sugar, and maple taffy. When the sap is boiled to a specific temperature, 
the different variations of maple food products are created. When the sap starts to thicken, it can be poured into the snow to make it taffy. Southeastern Native Americans traditionally supplement their diets with meat derived from the hunting of native game. Venison has always been a critical meat staple due to the abundance of white-tailed deer. Rabbits, squirrels, possums, and raccoons are also common. Livestock adopted from Europeans in the form of hogs and cattle are also kept. Aside from the more commonly consumed parts of the animal, it is also traditional to eat organ meats such as liver, brain, and intestines. The fat of the animal, particularly hogs, is traditionally rendered and used for cooking and frying. Many of the early settlers were taught southeastern Native American cooking methods. Indigenous people of the Great Plains and Canadian prairies have historically relied heavily on American bison as a staple food source. One traditional method of preparation is to cut it into thin slices and then dry it, either over slow fire or in the hot sun, until it is hard and brittle. In this form, it can last for months, making it the main ingredient combined with other foods or eaten on its own. The animals that Great Plains Indians consumed, like bison, deer, and antelope, were grazing animals. Due to this, they were high in omega-3 fatty acids, an essential acid that many diets lack. When asked to state traditional food staples, a group of Plains elders identified prairie turnips, potatoes, squash, dried meats, and wild rice as their staple foods. In the American Northwest, traditional diets included salmon and other fish, seafood, mushrooms, berries, and meat such as deer, duck, and rabbit. In contrast to the Easterners, the Northwestern peoples are traditionally hunter-gatherers primarily. The generally mild climate led to the development of an economy based off year-round abundant food supplies, rather than having to rely upon seasonal agriculture. In what is now California, acorns can be ground into flour that has times served as a principal foodstuff for about 75% of the population, and dried meats can be prepared during the dry season. Ancestral Plobolans of the present-day Four Corners initially practiced subsistence agriculture by cultivating maize, beans, squash, sunflower seeds, and pine nuts. Game meat and freshwater fish such as Rio Grande cutthroat trout and rainbow trout are also traditional foods. Ancestral Plobolans also are known for their basketry and pottery, indicating an agricultural surplus that needs to be carried and stored, and clay pot cooking. Grinding stones have been used to grind maize into meal for cooking. Archaeological digs indicate very early domestication of turkeys for food. Alaska native cuisine consists of nutrient-dense foods such as seal, salmon, and moose. Along with these, Huckleberries and bird eggs are traditionally consumed by Alaska natives. Seal, walrus, and polar bear are other large game that the Alaska natives hunt. The smaller game included whitefish and arctic hares. Due to weather, edible plants like berries are only available to be consumed in the summer, so the people have a diet very high in fat and protein, but low in carbohydrates. The game that is hunted is also used for clothing. The intestines of large mammals are used to make waterproof clothing, and caribou fur is used to make warm clothing. The First Musicians Another pillar of Americana is music, the backbone of its people. The first musicians anywhere in North America were Native Americans, who consist of hundreds of ethnic groups across the country each with their unique styles of folk music. Of these cultures, many, and their musical traditions, are now extinct, though some remain relatively vibrant in a modern form, such as Hawaiian music. Native American music plays a vital role in history and education, with ceremonies and stories orally passing on ancestral customs to new generations. Many Native American ceremonial music is traditionally said to originate from deities or spirits, or particularly respected individuals. Rituals are shaped by every aspect of the song, dance, and costuming. Native Americans perform stories through song, music, and dance, and the historical facts, thus propagated, are an integral part of Native American beliefs. Epic legends and stories about culture heroes 
are a part of tribal music traditions, and these tales are often an iconic part of local culture. They can vary slightly from year to year, with leaders recombining and reintroducing slight variations. Music and history are tightly interwoven in Native American life. A tribe's history is always told and retold through music, which keeps alive an oral narrative of history. These historical narratives vary widely from tribe to tribe and an integral part of tribal identity. However, their historical authenticity cannot be verified. Aside from supposition and some archaeological evidence, the earliest documentation of Native American music came with European explorers' arrival. Musical instruments and pictographs depicting music and dance have been dated as far back as 7th century. However, archaeological evidence shows the musical instruments in North America date to at least the archaic period, including instruments such as turtle shell rattles. You've been listening to the RPTM Podcast. If you like what you hear, please rate us on whatever platform you're listening on. Join us again next week when we talk about the seen and unseen of U.S. history. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. Also, for more information, check out the show notes on my website. The show was produced by me. Our editor is me. Written and researched by me. Music is Down South by Bliv Beats. I'm Ryan Lancaster, and this was the RPTM Podcast.